I said that that apart from my family, whom you know a little about now, uh, they're very special to me. Uh, apart from them, I don't think there's anybody who who means more to me, really, than than old Swamiji. Not as a not as somebody who's dead and gone, but as somebody who's very much alive. I hear him especially saying to me, Oh, Murai, oh, Murai, Murai, when, when he thought that I was overdoing praise or overdoing what he meant to me. Uh, he would... He would pull me back and say, Morai, Morai, I'm very ordinary. Don't try to make me anything special. Well, I didn't know I was meeting him. Of course, none of us did. Uh, he had written a postcard, and uh, as, a, as had often happened before, the postcard arrived after the person. So it arrived the day after Abhishek arrived. He came out, he was coming up to the hills and he got off the train at Bareilly Station, a junction, which was five, four miles away from where we were. And he, I think he came, I think he walked out. I don't know if he had a rickshaw. I think he walked out and carrying his stuff, you know, his rucksack and his uh, cardy stuff, uh, looking a simple, you'd think, a cra crazed man, really. He, he looked incredible. And uh, he, thought, he thought he would just find us, because he would find us, because we would have, be having lanterns. He felt that we'd be having a, um, Compline or something like it, uh, prayers for the end of the day. And when he got out into the where we lived, which was in a wood, he didn't find us at all. He wandered around for a good long time and uh, didn't find any sense, any sound or anything of the sunset. And uh, everything got dark. And he was just sort of packing up when he saw lights gathering and a, a gong. And uh, he followed the lights and the gong to our chapel. Chapel's hanging, a picture of it hanging on the wall outside. And uh, decided that must be who he was after. And he came and stood at the chapel door uh, <clears throat> which we always had a door only to hear because we couldn't stand the way churches in India <clears throat> always were locked up. And of course temples always open. And so he came and followed the lights and at the end of the service we all turned round towards this door, the door that was half a door to keep the dogs out, uh, and uh, and as we turned round and gave the peace to the next person with us, you see, and then to Heather, who's here now, uh, who gave the peace to the village friends, who were there in our spirits, but they weren't there physically. Uh, we looked out of the door, and there was this extraordinary figure. We've heard, we had heard of Swami Abhishek Tananda once or twice before, but hadn't registered really. But there he was, and he, we said hello and welcome, and what, what are we going to do for the night? So he was going to stay with us. Well, we assured him, and uh, 
And so he said yes, and uh, and after the event, of course, we decided we discovered it was entirely new to him. Uh, a a priest who is married, absolutely out of his mind, uh, never thought of such a thing really seriously, uh, and of course having his wife there, dressed in a sari, paddling around with no shoes and everything like that, as you know well enough. Uh, we were living on the ground. You see, by that time we'd lived at Savagram, Gandhiji's headquarters for 15 years, the last 15 years of his life. Uh, and so we had learnt really to live without any furniture, with a mat, with a string bed, charpai, uh, and uh, that's what we gave God, what we gave Swamiji. Uh, I've often wondered what changed Swamiji from an old traditional Breton, French, Roman Catholic very traditional. He must have been awful in the universe, in the uh, in the monastery sometimes, because he was ticking people off, you know, when they wouldn't be quite as as they should have been as monks. He was very much uh, very traditional indeed believing all the right things in a way. I see Salman Swamiji as being, being uh, just the man I would uh, have not wanted to meet particularly. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> and then, so quickly, he could change. And I think he changed vis-à-vis -vis the people who he met, because he hadn't met Anglicans. Uh, he hadn't met Quakers. He hadn't met married priests. He hadn't met Well, see, he was, he was meeting heretics all the time, from his point of view, you see, and yet needing them. And I have thought that the change, the, the really radical change, was that Swamiji began to see that everybody he met was a sort of gift, a sort of revelation to him. Uh, was so linked up with God that he felt God was speaking words to him about human beings. Before, he, you see, he knew it all. He knew it all as a Roman Catholic. He knew what they ought to believe. He knew that they ought to have Mass every day. They knew... knew or to go to confession. Oh, he knew it all. And when he came to us that night uh, and the following morning wanted to celebrate Mass and got his, got his robes all thoroughly crunched up uh, out of his rucksack in order to celebrate. Uh, especially, you know, that Catholic friends, uh, I don't know whether it's now, but would never celebrate the Mass without using the relics uh, which were in the, in the cloth, sewn into a cloth in the corner. Uh, now Swamiji, on one occasion when he, when he lost the relics or broke the relics, he was terribly upset, terribly upset. 
he couldn't celebrate the Mass that day. Uh, and then I, when I think of the what fun what God was having, that I, for my end, you see, was a very fundamentalist, non-Roman Catholic, very Protestant. Uh, and then Swamiji and I found ourselves so quickly, really, really talking to each other's hearts. Uh, that was a wonderful thing. I think that we also knew the the sort of in what he called the anguish inside himself, because when he came to us and Joe uh it took about a day or two before he really relaxed, before he could really sort of settle down, and because he said what an agony it was because he knew that these two realities were true and he had to say yes to them. And when he said yes, it wasn't just yes. I mean, it was yes with the whole of himself. Of course, that is what, what Swamiji, for me, is a man who did what he said. You know, most of us, do occasionally uh, say what we <laughs> say what we are, but uh, there was something about him. He was very honest, very honest, even if it was embarrassing for him. That's what made him say that he was so intolerably French. Then we discovered he was also a gas bag. Do you know the phrase in English, a slang expression, uh, meaning a talkative man? Uh, he had so much going on inside him. And you see, he was so much of a Frenchman that it was quite difficult for him, really. I think that's why we were lucky uh, that he he discovered us as being, well, partly being Anglicans. He had never met Anglicans before, you see. So he thought we were a bit queer. We are not nearly queer enough. Uh, and he thought, he thought we were very abnormal uh, Anglicans. And he didn't know what they were. And, uh, and that, it, it, it was a terrific relief, not having any Roman Catholics around, you see. Because then he could be free. He trusted us. Oh yes, once when he came to us, we had, it's in the war, one of those books, uh, two little huts actually built in our five and a half acres where we spent a day, each of us, the f three of us, four of us, four of us, uh, each of us spent a day in silence, a week. And, uh, and of course, Swamiji, when he arrived, there was complete chaos. Uh, anything like a community, silence uh, disappeared because Swamiji just talked. And he was talking all the time. So I said to him, Swamiji, do you know, we do have two silent huts here. Would you like to 
have a silent day. We'll bring over the food on a tray and you'll have something to eat and drink, uh, but you'll be quietly by yourself. And he said, Morai, what do you think I come here for? I don't come here to be silent. I come here to talk. <laughs> so, so it was the, with the greatest difficulty we made him silent. We had to remind him that his vocation was being silent. Uh, and he said, oh, you can always see him now. Then he had some silence. Uh, when it was convenient, <laughs> when it was convenient, I remember, <laughs> do you remember, I don't remember the man's name, a French professor. One day at lunch, uh, there was a, somebody said, Koi ha, you see, and we answered in Hindi. And, and I went out to see who it was. And I found it was a French professor who had arrived from somewhere. And, uh, and he said, I'm looking for Dobler's so everywhere in North India. <laughs> well, well, not much hope, you see, in North India. And uh, while well, I said, I think I, I, I probably said, I think I could help you. So he said, if you could, I'd be very grateful because I happen to be on the staff of some university in Paris or something. Uh, uh, very much a man of Taya Dashada, you know of him. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to write a book about him, and I feel that Dom Lasso will help me. So I said, well, actually, he's staying here, you see, Sochi so Voce, uh, quietly. Uh, and uh, <laughs> then I always forget, I put him, the Frenchman, the non henry Swamiji Frenchman, uh, in, the, in the common room, which we had. Uh, well, I brought him some tea or something, like, we were, which we always did for the visitors. And, uh, he had tea and biscuits and whatnot. We were finishing our lunch. So we finished our lunch and I took, I came, he was sitting there and I said, Swamiji, somebody's come for you. Morai, you shouldn't have told him that, uh, that I was here. You know perfectly well I've not come to talk to people, you see. So I, I still remember, because Swami, I said to Swamiji, uh, well, Swamiji, I'm prepared to tell small lies in order to get you out of embarrassment, but I can't possibly say you're in, uh, in Almora or Nainital or Delhi when you were here, when you were three yards away from the man, just outside. He was talking to me on the step. Uh, Swamiji was very annoyed. He said, I, well, you've, you've got to learn that I'm not here. When I come to stay here, I'm, I'm by myself. Uh, but we had a great argument about it, lying. Uh, And then the, the, the end of that story is that after lunch, I said, Swamiji, I'm going to, uh, going to introduce you to Professor so-and-so. Uh, and uh, he said, I don't want to see him. Don't want to see him. Well, I said, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You've got, you're getting so famous. Uh, 
people are coming looking for you. I can't help it. And <laughs> Swamiji said, whoa, famous. No, I'm not famous. He didn't like that at all. Uh, yeah. And then he started meeting the man. I walked him out there and introduced them to these two Frenchmen to one another. And by a, this was about two o'clock in the afternoon. By about five, I said, this is enough. Our dear silent Swamiji is now been talking for about three hours. And he can't stop. So we're now going to stop him. Uh, we had a, we had a great laugh. Stopping Swamiji from talking was of great difficulty, great job. Can we make him? Oh, I think of the of going for a walk in the evening with him, and he's meeting an old boy who, uh, as we approached, went like that. It was beautiful. And he stood for a second or two, and then uh, they were saying how lovely everything is. You see, beautiful to be alive. And uh, Swamiji would, would go down to the river. You see, it was the grace of the river, the grace of the Ganga surrounding them and then the uh, the other man would come and you know it was a beautiful smile it was a uh, and uh, I found that the other man the other sadhu had been silent from for years you see uh, but they had understood one another But you see this, the pattern, this chalice, he bought because we wanted to celebrate the Eucharist at Sapta Rishis, up above Rishikesh. And uh, the, the corner that is marvelously like, as perhaps you know, uh, marvelously like the Egyptian Desert Fathers, as far as we know. Uh, living on practically nothing, wearing no very minimum of clothes, and living there in her little huts, which were made really of leaves, uh, which would last a year, a year and a half, and they would do them again. We were going there the next day to celebrate the Eucharist, as I say, early in the morning, and we hadn't a, Euch we hadn't a chalice and baton. Uh, so he went to the shop, and I went too, and we went and found that, that chalice and baton, which have always been very precious since. Uh, it's very soft wood, soft uh, stone, but... Uh, but it means a lot. And when we got there, I remember we sang some of his songs, some of his songs of, you know them perhaps, uh, of the Upanishad, uh, which were all much loved by him. Songs that he had sung in the last years uh, on Arunachala. And then we sang them, and then we took off our clothes. It's fascinating that uh, Indians, when they celebrate a when they celebrate a sacrament, take off clothes, and uh, we Western people, for sacraments, put on clothes. There's quite a lot in that, I think. Uh, what we put on and take off. We, we, so to speak, dress up. They dress down. Yeah. Uh, and it's always like that. And then 
Of course, we've forgotten, as Swamiji said, we've forgotten the, the altar. What are we going to have as an altar? It's all sand down by the Ganga. And uh, he said, I'll go and get it. So he paddled off. You know, he tucked it up his his uh, jyoti, his, uh, jyoti uh, all the time around his tummy. And uh, so he could paddle into the Ganga. And there he found a stone that felt, because it was underwater, of course, he felt that it was a little flat. So he brought it out. It was rather heavy, bent him over a bit. Uh, and we had that stone for the altar stone on which we put these two things, the chalice and pattern. And he and I celebrated there. I'll never forget it. Our top half's bare, uh, as they would be when he celebrated the Indian way. And uh, the simplest, the much, as much silence as would go, so to speak, go naturally. And it never seemed to be too much. Uh, it was all so ordinary and so very special. It took a long time quite sometimes, especially up in Gyansu. Well, I remember I was celebrating the, the Eucharist and it took four and a half hours and we wondered what in the world had happened. And we laughed together uh, and, and said, we must be more careful in the future because we mustn't go on indefinitely. Uh, but. Uh, that was that was lovely that way in the in the attic of the house there was a little window and you looked through onto the Ganga. The dear Ganga the Ganga Mai, the river uh, that that flooded after Ga after I see keep on saying Gandhiji, after Swamiji died uh Swamiji was really never very serious about himself. In a way, he was so serious that he could afford to be light. Uh, I mean, he was, as I would put it, crazy about God. If he felt God was asking him to do something, you would, nothing in heaven or earth would stop him from trying to do it. Uh, and yet at the same time, he was the first to laugh at himself. You see, he never took himself too seriously. Now, I've, I find that is glorious. Of course, we roared with laughter together. Uh, especially, I think that Swamiji would say nobody should take him too seriously. Uh, they always took him with a pinch of salt, as we say. And and I'm trying to think of when we laughed most. Oh yes, there wasn't laughter. It was deadly serious in a way. Uh, but the, uh, you see, after the service, after our Eucharist in the morning, we always cut up vegetables for the middle of the day and asked our visitors if they'd join in. 
there was one visitor who cut up onions rather quicker than Swamiji could. Swamiji said, she humbles me, she humbles me, she humbles me. Of course, his, his English and his French got hopelessly mixed up. And uh, English spoken with a French accent and uh, French spoken with an English accent is much more silly, much more interesting than the real thing. Uh, but I never think of Swamiji as well, the twinkle in his eye, do you know? You, it said a whole mouthful about Swamiji. It didn't, it didn't sort of, uh, nobody could think of him as a great man, you know. He, he had just, He'd got so many foibles. He'd got so many things that he laughed at himself for. I wish I could remember all that. I remember an impression. I remember our wonderful times of the Eucharist first thing in the morning before other people were up. And I remember his book about prayer had just come out and, uh, and I was a sort of salesman for him. Uh, we sold about 150 copies at that, that show. Uh, And I remember uh, a bishop of Allahabad, where we lived, you see, at the Agricultural College. And uh, <laughs> I always remember him because he said to me, I think on the second or third day, you know, to begin with Murray, probably called me Father Murray, I don't know. Uh, we bishops were rather frightened of this meeting. We thought it would be very much against us. Uh, but you know, it's been translated, transformed for us uh, all about the way we are called now. Because to begin with, we when you know your excellency, your uh, whatever it is, all the way down, uh, brothers and sisters, sisters and mothers and fathers and and everybody to include everybody you are addressing, you see, and uh, and uh, he. And some of us felt it was really, especially the sisters, felt it was so stupid the way we addressed one another. We weren't, uh, uh, I remember one of them, I can't remember the setting, but one of the women, an older lady, because she wouldn't have been there probably, uh, who called out, aren't I a human being too? you see, expressing the desire that the church should wake up to the fact that we are younger and older and with this experience and that, but we're all one in Christ, whatever we may be in the realm of uh, bishop or cardinal or what not. And, uh, this bishop, who I knew particularly well, uh, told me that he, it had been a revelation for a day or two when they had all behaved properly 
and addressed one another properly. You know, your holiness, your, uh, your, what do they call bishops? Um, it was all frightfully formal. And then, mercifully, it had changed to brothers and sisters. Uh, and uh, and there'd been a terrific change. That was a wonderful meeting. It was extraordinary. Not because of anything that was decided, really. It was lovely to sit at meetings with Mother Teresa, etc. But uh, the change in the people, we really woke up to the fact that we rather love one another. You know, uh, we, were, we, were we were supposed to do as Christians, but generally you can't meet a, you can't go to a meeting without all the to do of calling people what they are called. You know, as if you were members of the House of Lords. Uh, and he was, that bishop was entirely changed by that. How did Swamiji uh, uh, experience this meeting? Oh, he, he felt wonderfully supported. Wonderfully supported. And on one occasion, we really had a rather gang. Uh, there was old Swamiji, who was our spiritual guide, and about four or five of us, people I know, know, know now, still, uh, who, who were in the gang with Swamiji, selling the book, uh, and, and getting Swamiji to speak. Because Swamiji was always a very quiet man. You know, you you never know what you to say. Swamiji did talk. Of course, he talked a lot. Didn't know quite where to stop. But at the same time, was very backward, nervous. He never, he never... He, You'd notice the man in the corner because of what, how he was dressed and his hair was all over the place and whatnot. But you wouldn't notice him because he was talking like a professor. Not a bit. He was very, yes, nervous, I think is the word. And especially nervous of of uh, Jesuits. He'd had bad experience of Jesuits sometimes. But he had a great many friends who were Jesuits too. Uh, but uh, that's, that's how it took him. And I always remember Swamiji. Swamiji, who was a giant in so many ways, in comparison with me. I knew that perfectly well. But Swamiji never made me feel small. And when you have failed in many ways, as I have, you feel small very quickly with human beings. Of course, there was one absurd occasion at that, uh, that meeting, Swamiji and I were in the same group with, with, uh, with uh, Mother Teresa uh, for two or three hours in the morning. We had a great time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Swamiji, you never met, you, you might have been frightened of meeting him a bit because he looked so peculiar, so to speak. 
but once you had met him, he would always ask questions. He wouldn't be a man who would talk to you as if you were the, you were the student. Uh, you were, you were being, you were his teacher then, listening. He was listening to what you had to say. Uh, a marvelous mixture. I always felt so experienced at things and at Christian things, Christian ways, and yet at the same time a listener, a real listener. And, uh, and of course I was going to tell you one afternoon I can see him there. He was sitting on my right there. And a Jesuit was, young Jesuit was just the sitting on the other side. And we knew that Rene Swamiji had to speak to the meeting, to the whole conference. And so Swamiji would always say no, you see. Uh, and then we, we picked him up more or less. I picked him up by one arm and the Jesu young Jesuit by the other arm and we launched him into the aisle and put him there near the, near the microphone and he held the microphone out there and addressed the microphone from a you know, a couple of feet away. We couldn't hear what he was saying. So there's the, now I knew, the, I know him if I looked in a particular book, the, the man was, who was the chairman then, a uh, very dear Jesuit, who was a professor at the, the place in uh, Delhi, Jyoti, Jyoti something. Uh, and, uh, and, and the man said, come nearer, Swamiji, come nearer, we want to hear what you say. So Swamiji picked up the, the, uh, the microphone that was standing there like this, uh, st picked it up and held it at his full length and brought it nearer to the chairman. And everybody roared with laughter because it hadn't done the trick at all. It just moved everything. So he, and so we all called out, Swamiji, he doesn't mean move. He doesn't mean move the, the, uh, the microphone. He means move, you moved nearer to it. Uh, you know, Swamiji would do that. Swamiji was absolutely sort of guileless. I don't know what word you'd call. He wouldn't push himself. He had to be pushed. And on that occasion, I remember particularly, because he affected many people. I mean, he w I don't know that it was he, but somebody said he went to that conference, which of course was a Catholic conference of all over. Uh, not very well known, but uh, he won their hearts. I don't know why be by being such a fathead, if you know what I mean about the microphone. But it's those little things that are sort of unconscious, you know. You can tell what the man has in his heart. I remember that, that question of, 
of Swamiji. It left a big mark on me. When he probably thought we were talking about theology out in the air, and he didn't trust theology up in the air. Uh, it, he trusted it if it, it, it caused people something. If it re meant a difference, it didn't need to, uh, to, uh, to agree with it. No, I don't think so. But he needed to know that the person who had spoken was, was intending to live what he was speaking. Uh, and then, then it was, you see, he suddenly said to me, Morai, is there anything but God? I mean, you could see there uh, how really at the center he was very serious. You could see there really the cause of his whole spiritual life, I think. You see in the convent, in the monastery, there was lots but God. But he was wanting to, to come down to the point where there is saying, there is nothing more I but God. I was moved by that. But uh, everything I've said is such a washout in comparison with the man. You know, it was, it was extraordinary. I think it meant to me that he had really climbed through the separateness of Christianity in terms of religion, that really he no longer believed in your choice between A, B and C, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity. Uh, he knew, he really knew deep down, however far he couldn't persuade uh, the authorities in Rome. He knew that Christ was for every man. Uh, he was free from this perpetual, what shall I say, trying to be right. You know, yeah. and he, and he was, and in, indeed, it was part of our privilege, huge privilege, to be there in Jotunicate and Orphan. Uh, when we, when we knew that we have made Christ sort of pocket size, like one of those little books that goes in and you're going on a long journey. You pop into your pocket and you a sort of pocket size book. We've done that really with Christ. And now, you see, he's the You see, you, 
when you know he's the Lord. You don't have to. You don't have to. You, you don't have to support him. You don't have to find arguments for Christ. All you could do, all you could do is worship. All you can do is worship, and in the end, be silent. For what God does. Sorry. You see, so often we Christians, we Christians have, have put a choice between people, uh, between so to speak, for so many articles in the bazaar. There's Muhammad, there's Gandhi, uh, there's uh, there's the the Chinese marvelous people great gifts of God to us all. And we have asked people to choose between one and the other. There's no choice. I have a feeling that we are We've, we've met them. I feel there's a, there's a world of wonder and mystery beyond all our poor bits of theology. There's a a completeness, Purnamada, Jaya Swamiji's favourite mantra, really, uh, fullness, fullness here, fullness there, when fullness is taken from fullness, fullness remains, there's a fullness, uh, uh, about this world. If we come back to Swamiji's saying what we remembered yesterday, Morai, is there anything else but God? And in that distant way that we are hardly capable of approaching yet, uh, There's a, there's a fullness beyond anything we've reached yet. Beyond, beyond. You remember how in his writings, on his Shirley's book, that, would, that thought came again and again. Never settle down. Never think you've got it. There's always a beyond, beyond. Ah. Uh, the mystery of of our wholeness which we can hardly conceive of. 